When senior private Hezekiah Ochuka and his batch of Kenya Air Force accomplices, Pancras Oteo Okumu, Joseph Ogidi Obwon, Charles Owira, Walter Odira Ojode, and Bramwell Injenin Jereman set out to overthrow the four-year-old government of President Daniel Arap Moi on 1st August 1982, they weren't aware that the coup d'etat would abort, after which they would flee to neighboring Tanzania where they would get betrayed and handed over to Kenya to face court martial, in which instance no advocate would agree to defend them. As the mutiny unraveled and got foiled, 26-year-old Moses Masika Wetangula was similarly unaware of just how much the events of the day would shape his personal and professional lives. As a curfew was enforced to deal with the remnants and aftershocks of the insurgency, Wetangula and his classmates at the Kenya School of Law on Valley Road got locked up for two weeks at Groven Hotel, which was located opposite present-day Sitam Valley Road and whose exact location is part of the Department of Defense headquarters today. Moses Wetangula, the quintessential principal, by Isaac Kotidi Amuke, narrated by Asha Mwilu. Part 1, from meek Catholic boy to rookie advocate. Save for a last-minute expulsion from friend's school Kamusinga just two months shy of sitting for his A-level finals on what he terms flimsy grounds, Wetangula had had an otherwise pious-looking Catholic upbringing, such that mentioning his name and the word coup in the same sentence would seem like a rich stretch of one's imagination, whatever context the word coup would be used in. Growing up in a cordially coexisting polygamous family of 30, it was imperative that from an early age, Wetangula had to learn how to get ahead of the curve, one way or another. My mom was blessed by the grace of God to have four sets of twins and seven singles. Those are 15 children. I'm one of the singles. And my brother, the MP of Westlands, is one of the singles, and there are several other twins. Some are living, some are not but uh, we're quite a number. Coming after an elder sister who passed on young, followed by a twin sister and brother, followed by yet another sister who succumbed young, Wetangula was the de facto firstborn in the homestead, considering the twin brother was being groomed to become a priest and was enrolled in a seminary, while the twin sister was sent to boarding school pretty early. I started school in 19... 1964, uh, that is eight years old, uh, when I went to Nalondo Primary School, uh, a school that was about five kilometers away from home. Those days there were very few schools, uh, and being Catholics, we were obligated to go to a Catholic school. There was a nearer school called Namilama DEB, which was not a Catholic-sponsored school. So we had a choice to go to one that was Catholic-sponsored. So we went to Nalondo Primary School. We walked every morning to and from school for the rest of my primary school life. And uh, at that time, of course, uh, the population in the villages was law. Uh, from one uh, homestead to another, you could talk of half a kilometer, sometimes even a kilometer. And uh, there was a lot of uh, wildlife at the time. We crossed streams to go to school. Uh, you could hear hyenas laughing in the forest as you pass. Sometimes you go to school as a group. If your siblings are unwell or have left ahead of you, uh, you have to run to school still because my mother was a strict disciplinarian. <laughs> there is no way you could malinger and fail to go to school. You will get a beating of your life. So even if you are late, you have to run to school alone. 
And because of uh, the security concerns, my mother had instructed us that uh, even as primary one, two, up to three kids, you left class at lunchtime to go home. Uh, she advised us to remain in school, which was very good, so that uh, by four, when the rest of the school breaks, we come home with our older siblings and neighbors. You know, as children in the family, you are not just children going to school, you're also a source of labor. So we could go to school during, uh, and our parents were coffee farmers, small time coffee farmers, maize, and other subsistence crops. During uh, coffee picking time, we were obligated to wake up at five, pick coffee to the best you can, then by seven, you leave to run to school. You're running for five kilometers and you must be on parade by eight. And uh, those days teachers were also quite harsh and, uh, and strict. If you come late, you get a punishment. Sometimes you are flogged, sometimes you are given uh, manual work to do. So that instilled a lot of discipline in many of us. I would proudly say throughout my school life I was an A student. Uh, I don't remember any time when I was uh, beyond number three in my class, uh, right from uh, my primary school. You know, we didn't have the luxury of pre-primary, there was no ECD, there was no nursery as it was then called. You went straight to standard one. So studied the A, B, C, D, I, A, E, O, U, and all those uh, writing in the, in the dust. Uh, to learn how to write, how to read, how to add, and so on, how to sing. Ideally, Wetangula would have found a place at Friend School Kamusinga for his Form 1. But unfortunately, much as he had excelled in his certificate of primary education, his head teacher at Nalondo failed to submit the candidate's school selections on time, leaving them in post-exam limbo. This is how Wetangula did his first year at Busakala Secondary School, before an uncle adopted him and took him to the better-performing Teremi High School, where Wetangula agreed to repeat Form 1 as a prerequisite for admission. Unfortunately, his uncle could only afford the tuition fees of 450 shillings, meaning he had to be a day scholar. Teremi was 15 kilometers from Wetangula's home. But along the way, I must uh, remember this. I used to walk along the road from Hueya through Namilama, Malinda, Chuele, Chepkaka to Teremi. And there was a bus company called Mawingo Bus that grew to one of the biggest uh, fleet of public transport buses in the country. There was a mze called Bakari who was the driver of Mawingo. And every morning, he drove the bus to Kitale and back. And he used to see this small boy walking along the road as every single day. <coughs> so one day, this muse stopped a bus and uh, called me. Say, little boy, where do you always go every morning? Uh, I see you carrying a school bag. Which school do you go to? I say, Teremi. He say, you go that far on foot? Yes. He said, from now on, I'll be giving you a lift every morning. That particular Mawingo bus used to pass by Wetangula's Muhuea home at 6.30 a.m. And by 7 a.m., Wetangula would be at Teremi. Bakari eventually took Wetangula to meet the owner of Mawingo, an Arab man called Abdul Karim to whom Bakari presented Wetangula's case. Abdul gave Wetangula a bus pass, which he used every day for three years. Considering the last bus from Kitale to Bungoma passed Teremi at 4 p.m., Wetangula skipped games to catch the bus. When I reached from four, I explained to my uncle, who was now my 
guardian in terms of education, that I needed to be in boarding school so that I can do better. Uh, that time, boarding fees was 150 shillings. Uh, he agreed to pay. And uh, for the last one year in Teremi, I was in Form 4. And when the results came out, we had done exceptionally well as a class with several of my friends. Uh, unfortunately, again, the head teacher of the school did not forward our choice forms for high school. So with excellent results, we were stuck there. Mm. Then my uncle was a friend of the then principal of Kamsinga. Uh, he went to friend school Kamsinga, talked to his friend, uh, the late Mualimi Julius Wasike. On seeing my results, he promptly admitted me. In the meantime, one of my other uncles, who was a police officer in Ukwala, had uh, gone to see the principal of Yala High School a Mr. Were, who also, on seeing my results, promptly admitted me. At Kamusinga, Wetangula was classmates with former Cabinet Secretary for Health, Cleo Pamailu, and former Webuye MP, Saulo Busolo. It was here that he got the opportunity to play sports, forming part of the Kamusinga soccer team, which won the national championship. It was also here that Wetangula got fascinated by the likes of James Orengo and Oki Ooko Ombaka, who had both been student leaders and turned out to be firebrand lawyers. <laughs> he, too, had to become a lawyer. It was possibly in getting ahead of himself as a wannabe lawyer that Wetangula took to speaking at the school Kamkunji with a little more gusto than had been the practice. A slippery slope, which resulted in his expulsion, alongside his Form 6 classmates, Peter Masengeli and Martin Rogers Mutende. They had to be given police escort as they sat for their A-levels. This was the first time Wetangula was going against established order. And uh, when I was in Kamsinga, I had made up my mind I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, you had to choose three courses that you want to do at the university. Then it was only the University of Nairobi. The second university, Kenyatta, was a constituent college of the University of Nairobi, only offering education because the education faculty had been moved from the University of Nairobi. So uh, the confidence I enjoyed as a, an A student was to choose uh, first choice law, second choice law, third choice law. Why law? Yes, because uh, at that time, I was, uh, when we were in school, we could see student leaders from the University of Nairobi as we read the newspapers every other day, inspiring us. Uh, James Orengo was a student leader when we were in school, and we could uh, see and read how uh, he was conducting uh, his affairs, his public addresses, Oki Ombaka and others. So th th that kind of influence, and also, uh, my grandfather had been a village elder. And as a village elder, he used to settle disputes in the village. Uh, neighbors quarreling over their boundaries, neighbors quarreling over grazing rights and so on. And I used to sit with him uh, sometimes as he deliberated on these issues. And he was a very just old man. Uh, that uh, really influenced me that I should uh, try my best to also be a dispute resolver within society. And uh, the route to take then was law. Wetangula survived the expulsion making the cut for the Faculty of Law at the University of Nairobi. Here, other than playing soccer with the likes of J.J. Masiga, Wetangula's life was largely lived on the straight and narrow, alongside members of the infamous class of 1981, which included National Assembly Speaker Justin Muturi, who was Wetangula's first-year roommate, Justice Mohamed Ibrahim of the Supreme Court, Justices Fatuma Sichale and Jesse Lesit of the Court of Appeal, Justices Boaz Olago, Agri Muchelule, Fredo Chieng, Joseph Karanja, 
Roslyn Wendo, Martin Muya, and Kaburi Bauni of the High Court, former Ministry of Lands PS Dorothy Angote, Federation of Kenya Employers Executive Director Jacqueline Mugo, and former High Court Registrars Jacob Olekipuri and Charles Njai. After graduating in October 1981, Wetangula joined the Kenya School of Law, where the coup found him. Aside from the coup, the year at the KSL flew past quickly and uneventful. The group exited the KSL in October 1982. What followed was Wetangula's chaotic, albeit brief, judicial stint. First sent to Nakuru as a district magistrate too, where he could hear between four to five matters a day, Wetangula was quickly dispatched to Kidimani in Machakos, where there was no work. You could stay for a week to handle one or two cases with a courtroom located behind a shop. After complaining to the judicial honchos in Nairobi, Wetangula was transferred to Kisi, where he found an overload of magistrates from where he was sent to Rongo. It was February 1983. Then uh, I could see that... Uh as a young professional working, my father had decided and decreed that I take responsibility for all my brothers and sisters for their education. Uh, these brothers and sisters include my younger brother, the MP for Westlands, uh, whom I brought up, and um, all the others. You know, my father was polygamous, uh, my stepmom had also a large number of children uh, who, in our family, you can't tell who is from which house because we are all one. So I took up uh, my siblings uh, from both houses and carried the burden, uh, close to 15 as well. Uh, so I decided uh, that then, if I was going to discharge these uh, family owners, I have to look for better ways of generating income. I decided to resign as a magistrate. When I resigned, I came to Nairobi, of course, with a month's salary in the hand, and that month's salary was 2,400 Kenya shillings. Uh, I came and we teamed up with my former classmate, uh, Mohamed Ibrahim, the current Supreme Court judge, and a friend called Murtaza Jaffa, he was at one time a judge of the labor court. So Jaffa invited us to share his offices on Luthuli Avenue near Ramogi Studio. Uh, he had a lot of trade union work. So the arrangement was we do his work in court for no payment, but share his offices for no payment as well. Luckily, David Malakwin, Wetangula's classmate from the University of Nairobi, had gotten employed by the Kenya Posts and Telecommunications Corporation, KPTC, and was given a three-bedroom staff house at the junction of Oleodume Road and Ngong Road. Malakwin invited Wetangula over, alongside their other classmate and future registrar of the High Court, David Olekipuri, who was working as a magistrate in Nairobi. Malakwin, Wetangula and Olekipuri each took a bedroom, with Wetangula and Olekipuri contributing 500 bob each to go towards water and electricity. Food was bought jointly by the trio. We lived very well and we only parted ways when we decided to have our independent families. And that was extremely good. And then within that time... Kenya was a de jour one-party state and following the attempted coup, an injured and emboldened President Moi had issued an infamous warning to the plotters and their real or imagined sympathizers. Nitawawinda Kamapanya, Mpaka Kwa Mashimo. A flurry of house arrests and detentions without trial were to follow as Moi firmed up his grip on state power. You know, it took time after the crashing of the coup uh, the f ringleaders of the coup 
uh, were extradited from Tanzania late in 83. And uh, Hezekiah Ochuka, Okumu, uh, and others were then brought and arraigned before the, the court martial. As a very young lawyer then, uh, new in the field, uh, all the senior lawyers uh, declined to take up that, those cases, so I understand, because uh, they had been approached. I will not say who my instructing client was, but uh, then uh, a very senior politician at the time uh, sent for me, because I had started appearing in court and, uh, and uh, doing uh, very visible cases uh, in representation, and doing well. So I was invited by this senior politician who asked me if I could take up the case of this uh, gentleman. Uh, the military itself was uh, also obligated under the law to make sure that anybody who is facing a case that would uh, result in a possible death sentence must be represented. Uh, so a combination of those two landed me into the court martial and I represented uh, this uh, gentleman. Everyone thought Wetangula was insane. My father was very frightened. Uh, he jumped onto a bus and came all the way to Nairobi and came to my office and told me, leave this case. You are going to bring problems to yourself and to us as family. Uh, I told him, Daddy, I will not uh, because uh, I think I'm doing the right thing and history will absolve me. And uh, I convinced him, I told him, just go home. Don't talk about it because you don't know anything about it and uh, let me do my work. And uh, he agreed and went back. As the cases got underway at court martial at Langata Army Barracks, Wetangula's notoriety within the legal fraternity went through the roof. Who was this crazy enough kid representing mutineers at such a dicey time? I must say uh, a lot of my colleagues, both junior and senior, uh, took me as a hero at that time. Remember, Kenya was then a de facto one-party state. And uh, the pattern of public uh, behavior in the country was conformism. Either you are in conformity with what was going on, or you faced the consequences. And... Uh, Many lawyers uh, were angling for state-related uh, uh, briefs. It was very prestigious to act for state uh, corporations. Uh, acting for NSSF was a uh, gravy train. Acting for then uh, Kenya National Assurance, acting for National Bank, acting for Kenya Commercial Bank, acting for taking briefs from the Attorney General. The, that was the dream of every lawyer, not irritating the state and taking up cases uh, that appeared offensive to the state. And uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, viewed with a lot of admiration and courage. I remember uh, there was a, a, a lawyer, I can't remember his name now. I don't know if it was Byron Jujadis from uh, Kaplan and Stratton, uh, who invited me to lunch. He said, I just wanted to know you know, Jojadis was a very strong criminal uh, defense lawyer. And uh, to see a young man, hitherto unknown, coming to his territory, it was a source of pride for him. And he invited me to lunch and uh, gave me a lot of uh, guidance. Says, when you cross-examine a witness, I know you do it your own way, but you must punch. Yeah? You must make sure that you leave a positive impression to the court because at the end of the day, when facts are, uh, are borderline, the impression you create has a bearing on the mind of the judge and the magistrate because they exercise discretion as well. 
After his clients were sent to the gallows by the court martial, Watangula, now joined by George Oraro, rushed to the High Court to appeal. Here, they won some and had the men set free and lost some, resulting in Ochuka, Oteo, Jereman, and Ojode facing the hangman's noose. There was no room for proceeding to the Court of Appeal. It was game over for the soldiers. What made you accept the, the request to represent these individuals at that time, considering the environment and the charges they were facing? First, uh, on, uh, when we were being admitted as advocates before Justice C.B. Madan, one of the greatest judges uh, Kenya has ever produced, better than ju many judges even in the entire Commonwealth, Justice Madan uh, advised us that when you take up a case, and this advice had also come from Feroz Noroji when he was teaching us at the School of Law, he says once you are in a calling as a lawyer and you become an advocate, you must always act without fear or favor regardless of the consequences. And you do not represent and protect what your client did, you represent the rights of your client. As fate would have it, almost immediately, Wetangula became first name basis friends and acquaintances with the likes of Fred Ojiambo, Amos Wako, Lee Mudoga, Richard Otieno Kwach, Joe Kwach, who's now deceased, E.T. Gaturu, among other notables within the profession. And you know, senior lawyers with the half moon glasses, uh, were 50 plus, you know, when uh, they walk to court with their hands dropped at the back of their, <laughs> of their courts and uh, uh, somebody is carrying their books, somebody is carrying their wig, somebody is carrying uh, their gown. But here was uh, a young man uh, gliding past and going to court. At barely 30, Moses Masika Wetangula had arrived, legally speaking. <laughs> 